<laughs> Welcome back. So, right in the middle of EM, yeah, we're going to finish this up hopefully today. At least the example. I think you guys will work a homework problem and it'll help to congeal all that stuff that we've been doing. So, you're going to go through these exercises. Then, I'm going to show you on the board, and you're just going to apply it to the multivariate Gaussian. So right now, I'm doing everything in just one-dimensional Gaussians. That's the way we've been writing it down. You're going to apply this to a multivariate Gaussian. So just keep in mind what a multivariate Gaussian looks like. Looks like this. It's going to look like, I'm going to say, I'm just going to write down proportionality for the first bit, because this is all that really matters. Okay, so that's a multivariate Gaussian distribution. It has some parameters, mu. Mu here is a vector, right here. So this is a k vector. It goes in this direction. This one goes in this direction, right here. So this is just transposed, this whole thing. So this is a column vector, and that's a matrix. So very similar. What's the normalizing constant? <laughs> I never really mark off too hard on this one. Well, what does it have to do with? It has a pi in there, right? So, there's a pi. There's probably a 2 pi in there. So, is this it? No. no. So, k divided by 2. So, if you just think about, if this was the identity matrix right here times sigma squared, this would be a product over a, a bunch of um, univariate Gaussians. So, you can think about it that way. So, that's how many times this gets built up. That's not raised to the k. Keep in mind, this is a determinant function right here. So, if this was the uh, sigma times i, Right here, this would be sigma producted up. Think about what the determinant does. So it just products down the diagonal. So it looks just like a product over univariate Gaussians if you have a um, k dimensional version of it. So I probably shouldn't use k twice here. That's not the same k. So let me just be a little bit more careful and just say this is p. This is p. So this right here is just the key by key. There's a couple little constraints on here. Um, somebody tell me what an obvious constraint is on the multivariate Gaussian. Sigma is yeah, sigma has to be invertible. So that's obvious because it's right here. I could also do this. Sometimes I'll see people write this out a little bit differently. And they'll write sigma inverse determinant uh, for the one half. Those are the same things. So I can take this power and I can pull it outside of the determinant. That's a property of determinants. This is a homomorphism if you're into algebra. So once upon a time, it was a big thing really neat so that I knew all these like words that I didn't know before. Anyway, that's a property of homomorphisms. So, uh, your job is going to be a little bit different when you're playing around with this than what I'm going to show you on the board, is you're going to be taking derivatives with respect to vectors. Derivatives with respect to vectors is just the partials of all the entries of that vector. It's very easy to do, and the rules that you're familiar with in calculus lend themselves over. So be careful with this, though. When you go to take a derivative over a matrix, you've got to be a little bit more careful. So when you do this on your homework, and ultimately what you're going to be doing is you're going to be coming up with this update right here for sigma. 
And that's just a weighted average over everything. So it's a weighted average over this product. Make that bigger. You guys can see that. So this is an outer product right here. So that's a matrix. And I'm just multiplying by two pi i k weights. The probability that the xi data point is in the k component. That's what the pi i k's are. I'll remind you of all of that. What I would recommend you do is go download a matrix calculus handbook on all the derivatives and all the identities. So what they don't teach you in calculus class are all these identities over matrices. And you won't find a class like that. So all it really is when you're taking these derivatives is you're taking all the partial derivatives of everything, expanding all the algebra, and there's some neat simplifications to everything. So if you don't want to do it all by hand and teach yourself what all these derivatives are and how you take a derivative over sigma, um, you can look in the matrix handbook. So that's what I'm going to point you in the direction of. I think that's a very good skill as a researcher to have, is know where to look things up. So matrix identity handbook would be your query that you would type in at Google. And there's one that everybody uses. If you guys have an enormously hard time finding it, then shoot me a question on Slack, and I'm likely to post it. But I'd rather give you guys an opportunity to go find it, scroll through it, Look for identities where you're going to be taking a derivative of something, and you're going to have to look for the right pattern. And it's going to not be in terms of mu's and sigmas, it's going to be in terms of like a's and b's or something like that. So you'll have to do your pattern matching. Um, we know how to do all our derivatives in univariate mode. So I'll walk you through those, and your job will be to butter this up into a p dimensional analog. So what you'll be doing on your homework is you'll be applying the uh, EM algorithm to basically finding the parameters of this model. You'll need to find the pi's, the mixture weights, the mu's, and the sigma's. We've been playing around with k, cap k is equal to 2, and you'll expand that a little bit to other cap k's. So if you know what cap k is, the number of mixture components, and you're just using that as fits, we call that a finite mixture model. There are versions of this that are infinite mixture models. So then, and basically, you can figure out what k is. I'm not going to teach you how to do that um, in this class. So there's a couple different ways I know how to do it, and I'll address it in my Bayesian class if you're so inclined to take it. But I don't want to leave you with nothing on this. Let's say you don't know k, cap k, but you know how to run this algorithm and solve for different mu's and sigmas. How would you, as a statistician, determine what the right cap k is? Because in real examples, nobody's going to walk in and give it to you. So what would you do? Run it until mu and sigma don't change very much anymore. Okay, but that's what you're going to do for any fixed k, right? So for any fixed k, you're going to run it to convergence. Mu and sigma aren't going to change very much more in these updates. And then you'll stop. And that's for a particular cap k. So if you weren't sure what cap k is, let's say you had three reasonable guesses. Maybe it's two, three, or four. How would you decide between them? Yeah, maybe the info. So something like that. So which information criteria? There's a couple of them. There's DIC, AIC, DIC. So I like DIC. That's the Bayesian one. But the only reason I like it is because it puts a hard penalty on how many parameters you're introducing into your model. And so you don't want to just use fit as the criteria because as you add more and more parameters, it'll fit better and better. We don't like that sometimes because it's not predictive anymore. And so, you know, some sort of maybe you'd look at likelihood ratios. So you'd look at the likelihood ratio of something, and if for a particular k it was much, much bigger, um, then you might be inclined to choose that. But we probably want to penalize and regularize the number of parameters in there as well. And so AIC, BIC, DIC wouldn't make any sense in this case, but I'll let you kind of work through. There's a lot of different criteria that you could use. Here's another one. 
So you can look at the predictive distribution out of this. And so hopefully you've learned a little bit about that. I'll teach you again in Bayes class exactly the way that I would do it. But I think right now you can look at log likelihood ratios and probably add a penalty for the number of constraints. And there's a lot of ways to do that. So I've seen a zillion talks on what is the right information criteria? What's the right penalty? So you don't just look at the um, difference of log likelihoods. So that's like the likelihood ratio. You take the log, it's the difference of log likelihoods. People call that the deviance function. If you multiply it by minus two, where does the minus two come from? It's from that, to wipe that thing out. So it's where that's always coming from on the log scale. So it's not just looking at minus two log likelihood ratios, it's minus some penalty as well. So you want to include that. What penalty? It should probably have something to do with the, the dimension of your parameter space. And so if I increase k in this example, I get some new parameters. I get a new mu, I get a new sigma, I get a new pi k. So you get three new parameters. Every single time I increase k, you probably want to penalize that. I think we all understand that, at least in principle. So uh, you could do other things. Maybe you could look at pulled out data. So you can, if you're data rich, you can pull some data aside and then run your model and see how well that pulled out data fits the various models for different k's. So there are a zillion ways to do this. I've seen a lot of talks where people come in and say, DIC is better than AIC and DIC in these examples. Does that lend to other examples? No, it doesn't. So I can get AIC to be BIC or BIC to be AIC depending on the example at hand. Uh, they'll both be very similar if the likelihood surface is very weak. So if the likelihood surface is very diffused, they'll be a little bit different. So what BIC is doing is it's estimating a Laplace approximation to the Bayes factor. And I'll tell you that all about that later, because we haven't learned what Bayes factors are. Um, and it's assuming a particular prior for a Bayesian as well. It's assuming the unit prior. So what I mean is it's assuming a Gaussian prior on mu that is going to be normal and it's going to have um, unit variance. So it's really tightly constrained. And that only makes sense to apply that when you standardize your data up front. And so you need to do that. So I see a lot of people use these things probably a little bit incorrectly. They're just looking for some reasonable answer. Um, AIC, I've seen a derivation of that that in the limit, it closely matches cross-validation schemes. But that's an in the limit thing. So how does it really work with like maybe 45 data points? Uh, those two different devices, probably you should, that would probably differ a little bit. You should probably check them both out and try to explain to yourself which one is working better in the context of your problem. So I'll just leave that open-ended. For your simulation study, you'll get to know K, because you'll be controlling it. Uh, the, the, probably the most in vogue thing to do is to put a prior on cap K. And so you might be thinking, if you're a Bayesian, maybe I could put a Poisson prior on it, because that's counting distribution. It's count. It's the first one everybody jumps to. You might say, well, I'm going to change that a little bit and make it negative by W. And put a little bit more diffusion into it, since the mean and the variance are constrained to be the same in a Poisson model. And so you have to calibrate that, and people don't like doing that, because then they have to go explain why they made their choices. And I think why people don't like doing it is because people don't like hearing about it. They're like, I just want, I, want to, I don't want to hear all your subjective rationale. So there's another device called the Dirichlet process, which is an infinite mixture model representation for a prior. And I'd have to teach you about process priors to understand this. You can't write it down in close form. And so you can bury it into a big MCMC scheme. And so I've had a couple students write theses on that. Um, anyway, lots to learn. There's always more stuff. But I would say Dirichlet processes in the last 15 years have kind of taken over is the go-to device for this. There are other ways people do these problems. So lots of ways. What we hope is that all those different ways we do problems kind of agree a little bit. And if they don't agree, then you explain it. 
What is the disagreement? Why do they disagree? And you choose which one is more appropriate for your problem. I'd say that's the most substantial part of being a statistician, is your explanation and making the right choices and validating your choices. Okay, that's a lot to be said about this. There's a lot more to be said. Okay, so let's see if we can derive these updates in the um, univariate case. So what you're going to be updating is you're going to be updating the pi i case. It's going to be these probabilities. We'll walk through that first. Then you're going to be updating these mu's in this sigma right here. And those are going to be solves to partial derivatives that I'm setting equal to zero. And so we'll derive a couple of those. I think we'll derive the first two. And then I'll give you this one to derive yourself. You can play around with sigma in the univariate case, try to derive it, and then try to derive it for the um, cap sigma. I think what I said for this right here um, is part A, try to find the MLE for the pi i k's. It's this thing right here. So it's just weighted averages. Um, or for the mu's. And then the sigmas, try to derive this as well. So I don't think I asked you to actually derive the, the pi i case, this update right here. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna implement all of this. So there's not another page here. Implement the EN algorithm for various settings of sigmas, pi's, and mu's. Show how well the EN algorithm works in identifying the model parameters described by this model at the top. And so some of you are gonna come in, you're gonna ask me, well, how many different cases do I need to look at? And which mu should I pick? And which sigma should I pick? And which case should I pick? And I'm going to say to you, can you guess? You tell me. So pick different examples that kind of exemplify when the algorithm works well, and pick some examples when it doesn't work that well. And so if all of a sudden I blow out the dimensionality of the problem, and I make P really big, and I only give you a few data points, the algorithm's gonna struggle. And so if I take modes and I push them closer and closer together, the algorithm's gonna struggle a little bit more. If I overlap the modes completely, the algorithm's really gonna struggle. It's not gonna be able to identify everything. We'll look at that example in a moment. And so, and as the dimensionality grows, I need more and more data because of the sparsity of the system. And so you'll just explore that. And so you'll say, here's some cases where it works really well. And so what I'd like you to do is do at least one or two high dimensional examples. What's high D? You pick. So I don't think it needs to be a million. So I think 10 would be pretty high. So it used to be, once upon a time, a 10 dimensional problem. What's high D? Nowadays, we've got a lot more storage and a lot more computing power. And so now people like to talk about it in the terabytes or something like that. It's, that's big. But you don't have to go that far with it. I just want you to get a semblance of understanding of what's going on here. Okay, so that'll be your homework. We'll come back and we'll look at this example, but let's just derive some of these updates. So we've gotten pretty far, but there's still a few steps that I need to include. Okay, so, so far, we have our Q function. I'm going to write it out as a cap theta. That's just my capital theta, just to denote there's a whole bunch of parameters in here. I could have just called it theta, but if you want to just substitute theta for my cap theta or my version of cap theta, that's fine. So we've got this right here, Q theta given theta T right here. This was defined in terms of an expectation. I'm going to write down what this was. So just, well, I'll write it down like this. This is going to be the log of the likelihood function. And probably I should say some clarifying points about this. I wrote it down like this last time. The complete likelihood. And one of our colleagues kind of barked at me about this and said, why don't you put the C on the right hand side? This whole likelihood business notation is driving me crazy. Uh, I'll put it over here. I, I do like it better over here. I think what I was writing down is, if you knew what C was and you conditioned on it, then I'd put it on the right-hand side. 
if I'm going to express it as a variable that I'm going to operate on, then I put it on the left-hand side. So that's a matter of my convention. I broke my own convention. So good catch. If you want to append your notes and throw it on the left-hand side because that's what we're operating on, you'll be in my camp of notation of what I normally use. If you just willy-nilly and throw it anywhere and you don't know which side of the bar to throw it on and your notation is totally and utterly inconsistent, you'll be like everybody else in the world. And so a lot of people throw it all over the place and they express different things with it. When people throw the updating parameters over on the right-hand side of the X over there, they're trying to make the basis theorem look obvious to you. So we've kind of went through that, why the different, way, the different ways people write it down. I don't care the way you express it. I do like that if you be consistent, obviously I'm a little bit guilty of this, um, but as long as you tell us the data is the thing that's fixed and everything else is the variables, then we're all talking about the same function. A little bit hard to express on the chalkboard. So, but in terms of computing, when I'm operating on it, you're procedural and you know exactly what you're doing. Okay, so this thing looked like this at the end of the day. Oh, and what I'm gonna be taking my expectations over are the C's right here, and I'm gonna be conditioning on previous draws of a parameter. And that's Q. So this turned out to be this. After a whole bunch of algebra, we wrote this down. I go from one to N. I'm going to write it down with a little bit more generality. But when we actually work through this, I'll make this a two. But I'll write it down in its full blown glory right now. So this looked like this. E to the, or minus one half. I'd already taken logs of everything and it wiped out my. So xi minus mu k squared over sigma k squared. This is going to be plus log pi k minus log sigma k. And then I multiply all of these by pi i k, right here. And this is where we left off last time. So this used to be the indicator function sitting right there. The ci is equal to j, and then we took the expectation over this thing. So we had written down this whole thing and derived this, and we had an indicator here. And when I slid the expectation over the indicator, the indicator, um, were the only parts that had the C in. So it was the only part with the expectation. So that was expectation of delta CI is equal to K. And I ended up taking um, the, the CI right here, given everything else. So a lot of times when I'm writing out notation, I get sick of conditioning on all of the data and all of the previous draws, and I'll end up just writing line conditional on everything else in the model. I'll be a little bit more polite about this. This is going to be the x's, and it's going to have to do with the updated model, for the previous model parameters. So that's a probability. So this is equal to the probability that xi came from component k. So I could rewrite this out like this. This is the probability that ci is equal to k given xi is the only point that I need to determine that so long as I have previous model draws. So it's that probability. So every time I'm doing a calculation and I'm looking at the math and seeing if it's right, I'm always asking myself what exactly is it? So what is, what is the nature of this thing that I'm computing? But ultimately, we're just computing that. I don't need all the other x's in the presence of the thetas because they're all conditionally independent given the thetas. And so that's just looking at this. So I'll just imagine I've got some k is, cat k is equal to 2. 
And if I have these model parameters right here, this is going to be mu1 at the teeth iteration. This is going to be mu2 at the teeth iteration. There's some sigma1 in here at the teeth iteration, and there's some sigma2 at the teeth iteration. That defines the width of these. The pi caves are all just showing up in here, right here, and they're measuring the heights of everything. So the pi caves are also involved in that probability. So if I know what the parameters are, at least I have some idea of the previous iteration of the algorithm, then I can use those to compute this probability. And so I'll write down that probability right over here. Let me just be really specific. So the pi i k's probability that we're in the uh, previous step. Oh, and I should probably be real careful about this notation. I've got the theta t's in here, so this is conditional on the previous draw. So I should, probably should be specific that those are the pi i k's at the last draw of the algorithm. Those are something that we're updating and we're computing. So what those look like is just this. So this is all just univariate stuff. Sigma k in the t iteration. This will look like e to the minus 1 half xi minus mu k in the previous iteration, I have to plug something into my computer, so it's a draw. Here's some clumsy notation, but I think you'll get my point. I have sigma squared, which is my parameter, and I have indicating it's at the teeth iteration. If one of my students brought this in on a paper, I'd say change your notation. So I've got two things in the exponent. I don't like that. So if they change the notation and drew a brace around it, I'd say change it again. I'd say make it a V. So I'm going to leave it as a sigma square and just make it a little bit ugly right here, but it's okay. So looks like that divided by, oh, and I get a prior on here, pi k. This is at the previous iteration right here. So I want to just point out this pi k right here is really going to be our updated value of that from our previous location. So how do I get this right here? And the way that I'm drawing, writing it out, pi k is the t iteration is just going to be these things. We'll derive this in just a second. So that's what I'm going to be plugging in for that thing. And then I normalize it. So k goes from 1 to cap k, 1 over 2 pi, sigma k, e to the minus 1 half, xi minus mu k squared over sigma k squared at the teeth iteration, that's at the teeth iteration, and then I have my pi k here. So same thing. So this is just the normalizer to everything. And so what you're going to be doing is computing all these probabilities um, for each one of the k's. You don't need to do all of them. You need to do cap k minus 1 of them. If you do do all of them, you get the exact same answer. You take that last one and subtract off the sum of all the other probabilities, because they all sum up to 1. So this is that probability. So if we just think about this for a second, what is this telling us? It's really just this picture, and it's seeing where the xi is, and how close that xi is to my previous draw. So it's just measuring relative distance right here. Now there's a lot of ways you can think about this prior. So we could, could have done lots of stuff. Here. I'm using my previous draw. This is kind of a reinforcement learning way of doing this, and it helps the algorithm converge a little bit faster. So that I just keep plugging this in. Saying that, 
you've got a lot of options as a Bayesian. If you're going to apply Bayes' theorem, you get to choose your priors. And they're going to have impacts on things. So if I didn't want to do this, if I think that, I, hey, I, you know, I'm computing this probability every single time, I'm using the data to do that, to compute this probability, my prior didn't just fall out of nowhere. I don't have any good objective reason for picking it. I'm just picking it because it's making my algorithm converge fast, something like that. You are violating the likelihood principle. That may or may not bother you. So I shouldn't be conditioning my priors on data data that I'm using in other parts of the model. So some people would argue that. Uh, again, what we're converging to is a maximum, so we're not actually calibrating all the uncertainty in the parameters. So I would say it doesn't really matter. You could use a flat prior right here, and I see people do that, and so this would be, you know, maybe instead of this, I could make this one over cat k. That would be the uniform prior. I would have one of them cat k here, and they'd cancel out so of each other. And so the cat k's would cancel out, and I would just have this bit right here. And people will argue, oh, that's prior free. I didn't do anything because I didn't write it down. It cancels out. And so some of the machine learners will call this the responsibility index when they do things like that. And they won't say they've done basis there. So they'll say, this is the responsibility for point xi, and they're not saying it's a probability. I like thinking of it as a probability. Those between zero and one kind of makes sense. I kind of like all the choices, and I like talking about this thing, because it gives me a lot of levers that I can pull. If you do use the uniform choice, or if you just keep updating like this, you're going to get the same answers. It's just that this is driving you to your answer faster, because it's updating every day. There are other bells and whistles you can do. So imagine this classification problem had some context. I haven't said what the modes are. But maybe I know something up front about how much, how many things belong in each class. So probably one of the easiest examples you can think about is a spam filter. Something like that, where you have spam or no spam. And we kind of understand the game. That if you have a ton of spams flying in, you probably should encode that right here. And so in weight, how much you want to put, say, things are spams. And so I want them all out of here. So I expect to get 99% spams. So every email that comes in, I'm going to say has a prior mass of 99 spam and 0.01 non-spam. And then one of you guys is going to send me an email and it's going to get thrown into the spam filter. So, and so that might not be a very good thing to do. So maybe I want to upweight things and say they're not spam. And so maybe that's the error I want to guard against. So just keep in mind, there's always an error when you make a decision on either side of things. Statisticians will call those type one and type two errors. We'll get into that in chapter eight. Um, there's other ways that you can think about those two trade-offs, those two different errors. So I might say, I'm going to upweight that it's not a spam because I want all the emails to come in. I don't want to miss one from a family member, a friend, or a student, something like that. And so you have a little bit of control. All of us, if we were building this for a spam filter, a two classification problem, would probably have different pies. And so if you're using something like Google for your email, it tries to figure out, depending on when you're saying, now that's a spam and you're labeling things, it learns, and it learns your parameters. So um, they do this on Facebook, or any sort of system that has a recommendation built into it, is it tries to learn your parameters and tries to do things so that you'll click on that stuff. So anyway, lots of variability here. When you are working with mixture models or something like that, a lot of software packages will let you change weights for the classification. And what they're changing is the Bayesian prior. So they're all encoded with Bayesian priors. At least that's the way I see it. If you want to say it's not a Bayesian prior, but it's the exact same formula, I guess I'm okay with that. So call it whatever you want. Responsibility index if you choose. Okay. Another set about that. 
So that's what the pi i k's are. So just give myself a little bit of room. And I just want to think about this equation right here. So that's my q function that we've written down. So this is q. And so now I need to optimize all the parameters in Q. I can compute these probabilities. So I plug them all in, and now I want to optimize this function. So I'll do the, the basic thing that I learned in calculus, and it works out pretty well here. You probably can do faster optimizations if you knew a lot about optimization, but we've got a lot of computer horsepower. We don't mind wasting a couple milliseconds sometimes. So let's just imagine cap k is equal to 2, just so I can write everything out in its full-blown glory. Um, let's solve for pi k at the t plus first iteration. So I'm going to try and solve for those things right there. Um, let me just write out what that function looks like. Keep in mind, when I take a derivative of this over the pi k's, this term is going to cancel, and this term is going to cancel. So when I'm operating on the pi k's and I go through this function, all I'm going to do is take a derivative with respect to the pi k's. That's gone. That's gone. As soon as I hit it with a derivative, there's zeros. So if you'll allow me, I'm just going to get rid of it for this step. I'll try to write out everything correctly. So I'm going to do this for pi 1 first. So keep in mind, k is equal to 2. And I've got this constraint built in. Pi 1, t plus 1, plus pi 2, t plus 2, is equal to 1. So we're going to have to work with that right there. Here's what I'm going to do. What they usually teach you to do in calculus class is you add your constraint in, so I'll add plus, lambda, and then my constraint over here. So I do something like this. Pi 1, um, and I'm going to just leave that. So, because I don't want to talk about the Lagrange multiplier thing. So, what you do is you just add in that constraint, pi 1 plus pi 2 is equal to 1 right over here. You usually subtract off pi 1 plus pi 2 minus 1. So, I pull everything over from the 0, and then I add that constraint over here. When you do a Lagrange multiplier problem, all you're going to do is you're going to take a derivative with respect to lambda. So you're going to take a derivative with respect to the Lagrange multiplier. And I'm going to set it equal to 0. My constraint would be pi 1 plus pi 2 minus 1, so times lambda. So when I take this with respect to lambda of everything, I'm going to get the constraint back. And I'm going to set it equal to 0. So what I'm going to get is pi 1 plus pi 2 minus 1 is equal to 0. I'm going to throw some hats on here. The hats are really the t plus 1s. And so then I would solve that. All the Lagrange multiplier back gives you back when you add it in is it just gives you the constraint back. And it's part of your system and you utilize the constraint. That's all it does. Now, Eric's probably going to say no, there's more to it. So, because when you solve for lambda, and you try to figure out what actual lambda is in all of this, and you go back through it, that's the shadow price. So that's the dual solution to the problem. And what that means is it says if you lighten up your constraint, if you're able to flex the constraint a little bit more, it shows you how much you would gain in the objective function. I don't know if they taught you that in finance. So, not yet. So there is a little bit more to this in the interpretation of what lambda actually is if you solve for lambda explicitly. I'm not going to do any of that. We're not going to discuss that. I have a question. So in there, is it t 
plus two or t plus one. Yeah. Oh, sorry, that's a little That would be crazy. Thank you. Okay, so all I'm going to do is I'm just going to impose the constraint. That's what a Lagrange multiplier does. If I were writing a paper, I'd probably do this more. So, but what I'm going to get is I'm going to get just this k equation. I goes from 1 to n, that's the sum, and k is e cap k is equal to 2, so I'm just going to express the sum right in here. What I'm going to get is I'm going to get the pi 1 um, times the pi i ones. This is a lot. Plus log pi two pi i two. So I'm going to take this derivative. I just want to point out what this is right here, where I just got this from. I killed that. I killed that. So we got rid of this. We got rid of that. When I took the derivative, they're zeroed out, and I just expanded this sum when k is equal to two. So what I get is I get log k times these pi i k's. They get pulled in. So for the first term in the sum, it's that. And for the second term, it's that. If you would like to write all these pieces out, you can do that. They've all turned to zero as soon as I've taken the derivative. So then I'm going to set it equal to zero. When I set it equal to zero, I'll throw the t plus ones on top of this. So right now, it's just some function. So this is going to be um, sum i goes from 1 to n pi i1 over pi 1 plus, I'm just going to drag this sum over right here, i goes from 1 to n pi i2, take the derivative of log pi 1, it's a pi 2. We're about to make a mistake. What we're going to do is we're going to impose the constraint right here. This is equivalent to doing the Lagrange multiplier thing. So I'm going to get rid of that, and I'm going to write 1 minus pi 1 in here. That's what the Lagrange multiplier thing would have done for you. Is it would have taken that, solved for pi 2, and thrown it in right there. So this is pi 2. So when I take a derivative with respect to pi 1, that's 1 minus pi 1. And then I've got the chain rule. So it's going to change that into a negative sign. Now, we're going to set everything equal to zero. As soon as I do that, I made a mistake. So this would be a little ding on a midterm. Change that into an arrow right here. And throw my t plus ones on top. That's substituting for my half notation. So I, instead of a half, I'm just saying this is my update, and that's my solve. So you can solve this. I'll let you do the very last step. Just save us a little bit of algebra. But this is going to give you pi 1, t plus 1, is going to be equal to pi, sum of pi i 1s. If my teeth iteration, i goes from 1 to n divided by n. When you do this solve over here, I call the, the pi 1 t plus 1s over the left hand side. I divide everything by this sum. Keep in mind the pi i 1s and the pi i 2s sum together add to 1, their probabilities. So, really, what you get at the end of the day is this pi i 1 t plus pi i 2 t. So when you do all the simplification, you'll come up with this is your solution. These things are equal to 1. They're probabilities. So we're going to enforce the constraint that they're probabilities. And so when I sum up all of those, this whole term right here is just an n. Summing one up n times. So that's what you do. Let's do one more. Let's do the mu. Just algebra. So fill in that line with two lines of algebra <laughs> a little bit later. 
Let's do the mutes. Mute's a little bit easier because I don't have a constraint on you. You can be anything. So I don't have to do the run multiplier thing. So. UK is T plus one. So same exact thing. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to share my Q equation. And I'm going to look at where the mu k's occur. This is going to cancel. This is going to cancel as soon as I hit this with the derivative over mu k. So I'm going to get rid of them. I'm just simplify all the notation. D mu k, this is going to look like this. I goes from 1 to n, minus 1 half xi minus mu k squared over sigma k <laughs> squared times my pi i k's in the teeth iteration. So all I've done is I pulled this thing all the way over here. I'm taking a derivative with respect to mu k. And so in this thing right here, if cap k was 2, there would be two of these terms that show up. But I'm taking it with respect to mu k specifically. So we might think about this maybe as mu 1, if you want to give it a specific value right here. So in this second sum right here, the mu 2 would appear, but as soon as I hit it with the derivative with respect to mu 1, it cancels. So I'm not even going to write it down. So I don't need to term with mu 2s in there because they don't have the mu 1s. So I'll take my derivative. This is going to be sum i goes from 1 to n minus 1 half. I'll bring down the 2 right here. So 2 xi minus mu 1 over sigma 1 squared. And then I've got some chain rule business going on here. I've got a derivative there. So plus, and then I've got my pi i case. So keep in mind what the, this mu is going to be once I take this derivative. This mu right here, and I should say this is probably t evaluated at the t iteration. I'm going to need some value there. And this is going to be at the t iteration. So as soon as I set that equal to zero, I need to change my notation. That's not equal anymore. And I need to throw my t plus 1 up here. So the question is, is which sigma am I using in this? Use the one in the previous iteration. So if you don't know what they are, you grab the one from the past. And then I'm going to solve for everything. So keep in mind, it doesn't matter what I plugged in right here for sigma. Because as soon as I set that equal to zero, I can multiply that thing out and just get rid of that. This is obviously just a one right here. So I get rid of that. And I'm left with basically the solution. So this is going to be sum of the xi's times pi i k t i goes from 1 to n. I'm just going to pull everything over on the other side. This is going to be my mu 1 t plus 1 i goes from 1 to n times these weights. Pi i, oh, and I need to just throw in, that's a 1 right here. Sorry, those are all 1s. As soon as I change that to a 1, I should have changed them all to 1s. So, and then we're basically done. This doesn't have anything to do with the index, I can pull that out. So I have the sum of the pi i 1s, and what I end up with is mu t plus 1, 1 is equal to sum of the x i times pi i 1 divided by the weights. And that's what we have from last time 
and it looks like the thing that's in your homework as well. You can do the exact same thing for sigma, and you'll come up with the, the form that you know. And it's going to be in your K, in your p-dimensional example, it'll be that outer product that I wrote down for you. So what I'd like to do next time is come back, run the code a little bit in a simplified example, just so you can kind of see what goes on in the code. There are a few issues that we have to discuss. So we'll pick up with that next time, and then we're going to move on. So I think we're going to get ready to approach some real decision theory. And so if you want to skip ahead and start reading over the next couple sections, it'd be a good time for that. That's it for now, you guys. I'll see you on Friday. Thank you.